Okay, so our next speaker for this session is Barbara Soda. Uh, uh, Barbara is going to talk about uh, Newton cradle spectra. Actually, very, very interesting paper, very interesting topic. Uh, uh, Barbara is also a student here at University of Waterloo. Barbara, uh, whenever you want, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, so today, uh, I'm also a student at Perimeter. I didn't uh, write it on here, but that's important to mention. So I'm going to tell you about recent work with Ahim Kempf that we called Newton Cradle Spectra. The question that we tried to answer in this work was what happens when we add two Hamiltonians? So uh, in other words, what happens to eigenvalues and eigenvectors of a free Hamiltonian when we add some interacting Hamiltonian to it? And typically we all approach this problem perturbatively, uh, but there are some non-perturbative results, such as the Wigner von Neumann result on level repulsion and uh, Cauchy interlacing. Uh, but there, are, we would, I think, all agree that there are too few results because we would all want to understand what happens to the Eigen system when we add an interacting Hamiltonian. But here today, I'll tell you about a new non-perturbative result that we call Newton's cradle spectrum. So we start with a self-adjoint matrix S0. Think of, a, think of some free Hamiltonian, uh, and we know its eigenvalues and eigenvectors. For example, uh, if it acts on a four-dimensional Hilbert space, it has four eigenvalues. Now, what happens to these eigenvalues when we add a projector onto a one-dimensional subspace to it? So here in this formula on the bottom, we've added to our free Hamiltonian S0 a projector VV multiplied by a real number mu, which we call the coupling constant. So what happens to the eigenvalues when we add this projector? I can immediately tell you what happens generically. A gener generically meaning when the overlap between the vector V from the projector and an eigenvector of the original Hamiltonian SI, when this overlap is non-zero, we get the, the what we call the Newton cradle behavior. And the reason why we called it that is that it visually resembles the Newton cradle. So um, when we change the coupling constant mu from minus infinity to plus infinity, um, the, the spectrum behaves in the following way. The smallest eigenvalue shoots up from minus infinity to some finite value when it kicks all the other eigenvalues. And then the largest eigenvalue picks up the momentum and then it shoots off to plus infinity as the coupling constant mu shoots up to plus infinity. And here we'll see a video that shows that behavior and you'll see the resemblance to Newton's cradle. Okay, and uh, one important thing to mention is that um, when this overlap between an eigenvector, let's say S1 and V is zero, then that eigenvalue in this case S1 would, uh, would stay frozen. So that would be just a, on this graph, it would just be a straight line that all the other uh, eigenvalues would not even notice. So that's like a trivial case where the overlap with the one of the eigenvectors is zero. Okay, um, I've emphasized in the beginning that this is a non-perturbative result. So we have all these uh, formulas that are exact for all values of the coupling constant mu. Um, so we can rigorously prove some things such as that the eigenvalues all move in the same direction. Um, and there are formulas uh, that uh, support that. So um, they don't always move at the same speed, but they always all move in the same direction, which is important for some applications. Um, another thing is that we can express the new eigenvectors. So the eigenvectors, when we add the interaction Hamiltonian uh, VV, we can express these new eigenvectors in terms of the old eigenvectors SN. And this is the formula uh, which connects the old to the new eigenvectors. And we have this important property for sampling theory, which is that the spectra uh, in Newton's cradle covered the entire real line exactly once. So when we take the union over all the coupling constants mu and over all the eigenvalues in the spectrum, we get that they covered the, uh, the real line exactly once. Um, and one of, the, one of the consequences of this is that if we want to create a new spectrum from the old spectrum by adding the projector to the old Hamiltonian, and we want S, some number S to be the new eigenvalue of this new Hamiltonian, well, we have this formula in the bottom which connects the coupling, coupling constant mu to the new eigenvalue. So we know exactly that if we want S to be a new eigenvalue, which coupling constant mu do we need to use to achieve that? 
Uh, I've also shown this uh, the formula that connects the coupling constant to the eigenvalue uh, here graphically on the plot. Uh, here you can see how the spectrum evolves as we change the coupling constant mu from minus infinity on the bottom to plus infinity uh, towards the top. And you might be wondering where does the math come from? Um, it was all inspired by sampling theory. So we've probably all heard about Shannon sampling theory, which was done around the year 2000, uh, generalized uh, to uh, Shannon sampling with varying information density. The way this was done was using the von Neumann method of self-adjoint extensions of symmetric operators. But since these only exist in infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces, it was not clear if it was even possible to generalize this to uh, sampling when we have a finite uh, number of samples. So in thinking about this, this is how we came up uh, with, the, with this Newton's cradle spectra. And in fact, uh, this Newton's cradle spectra where we add the projectors to a self-adjoint project uh, to the self-adjoint operator actually came from the Newton's cradle for unitary operators, uh, where instead of addition, we have multiplication. And I, I can't I don't have time to get into this too much, but uh, the, the connection between the unitary and the self-adjoint uh, Newton cradle spectra is the Cayley transform, not the exponentiation, interestingly. Okay, and this is the Newton cradle spectra for the unitary operator. It's uh, it's similar, but the eigenvalues move on the circle instead of uh, on the real line. One interesting thing that we can understand using this uh, method is um, level repulsion. This is the phenomena where we add to our free Hamiltonian A, uh, some other Hamiltonian B. And then as we vary the coupling constant C, we find that the uh, that the levels of the eigenvalues tend tend to rip, uh, tend to not cross. So generically, people have seen this numerically that uh, the the levels do not like to cross. And using Newton's cradle spectra, we can understand why that happens. Uh, first, we have to decompose the interaction with Hamiltonian B into projectors. Then we add them one by one. And if you remember from uh, the first part of the talk, I said that uh, as long as the uh, overlap of the projector V with the eigenvectors is non-zero, then the, all, all of the eigenvalues move in the same direction. And that's also the reason uh, why they do not cross. If they're moving in the same direction, they do not cross. So generically, this overlap between a projector and an eigenvector is non-zero. So that, that's why generically we don't have level crossing. And there are many uh, applications of Newton's cradle to to um, to physics and other places. Basically, wherever you you're using linear algebra, I'll just mention adiabatic quantum computing, where we gained new insights into how algorithmic complexity translates into gap narrowing, and we know that gap narrowing leads to slowdown of, of computation. Uh, I mentioned earlier that uh, this method allows us to generalize sampling theory to cases where we have finite number of samples and varying information density. And there are other uh, applications in progress. Um, today, I'll tell you more about Cooper pairs and an application to RQI. And I'd just like to mention what, this application where uh, I made an extension from self-adjoint to normal operators that's called bubble theory which gives us a new connection between alge algebra and geometry. And it has so far, I've come up with applications to classification problems in machine learning. There are of course application to open system with non-Hermitian time generators and probably many more. So this uh, Cooper pair application, if you know this calculation, uh, Leon Cooper asked if he can add two electrons to a Fermi C and uh, have them create a bound state somehow. And so he wrote down an ansatz wave function and wrote down an interaction Hamiltonian, which uh, includes an exchange Hamiltonian. Um, and then in his calculation, he simplified the interaction at some, it was reasonable to simplify the interaction to be, uh, to have the form of a one dimensional projector for each, each angular momentum sector. 
Um, so now he has this uh, interaction that's of the form uh, as in Newton's cradle spectra. So we could immediately tell Leon Cooper, you know, uh, what kind of interaction does he have to have in order to create a bound state? Basically what he wanted is from a spectrum uh, that has the lowest eigenvalue zero. And then of course some excited states, I made a, I made a, like a toy a picture here. He wanted to have a new eigenvalue that's lower than zero. And Newton's cradle immediately tells us that if we want to achieve that, we have to add a projector with coupling constant mu less than zero. And that's exactly what he found uh, back then. And that was the precursor to superconductivity. Finally, because this is an RQI conference, I would like to tell you about how Newton's cradle gives us an insight into the dressed vacuum. Um, Two minutes, Barbara. Okay. Uh, so uh, we start uh, in the standard way. We have a, a free Hamiltonian uh, and an interaction Hamiltonian between Unruh David detector and a quantum field. So the Unruh David detector free Hamiltonian is this sigma Z. Uh, the field's free Hamiltonian is the number operator same as usual, and in their interaction is just sigma x times phi of x. Okay, if we want to use the methods of Newton's cradle spectrum, we have to write the interaction Hamiltonian as a sum of projectors, which is what I did here. So we have, uh, you know, the we have the tensor product between a sum of projectors for the detector and uh, projectors for the field. And, um, we ask uh, using the Newton's cradle technique, what happens to the ground state? Well, initially the ground state is just a tensor product between the ground state of the detector and the vacuum and the field. Then we look at the interaction Hamiltonian. We identify the terms that will contribute to the change of the vacuum. And we find that the most interesting term, there are not that many, but the most interesting term is the one where the, the, where the projector affects both the detector and the field at the same time. And it's interesting that these uh, subspaces on which they project are kind of like a, a super uniform superposition over all the states of both the detector and the field. And so now we have, uh, we are looking for the, the dress vacuum is basically the ground state of this Hamiltonian that I've written here. Um, the things simplify if we assume a cavity, which means that we have a gap between a ground and an excited state. And then uh, using Newton's cradle, we can just uh, find um, what, the, uh, what the lowest eigenvalue is, what the coupling constant corresponding to this lowest eigenvalue is, and um, the overlap between the dressed vacuum and the old eigenstates. And for example, we can immediately see that um, all of the old eigenstates uh, contribute to the dress vacuum. And if you want to know more about the details, you have to do this calculation by yourself. I just want to demonstrate how this method can be useful also for RQI applications. So thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Aura. very good.